thank you. Thank you so much for the, this presentation. I want to make sure that we have time to get to several of the questions that have come up in the in the chat box and the Q&A box. Um, I would ask all participants to please share any questions that you might have in the Q&A box because not everyone can see if you place it in the chat box. As a reminder, for next week, we will have another session, same place, same time, next Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern, where we'll, we will be embarking on the topic of maternal mortality, death, and morbidity, sickness. We have three very dynamic speakers. We hope that if you haven't registered already, you register, that you complete the evaluation form, and that you help us with promotion. Please tell your friends, tell your family, tell your pastor, tell your boss, tell everyone you can about this series. And this is how we make change happen, as you heard Claire mention. Um, with that being said, let's move into some Q&A and get down to it. There's several questions in the chat box. Um, the first one that I would like to pull out is from Megan Deacon Hansen from Florida State University um, College of Medicine. She has a question for Dr. Singla. In studies in which you've used peers for behavioral health care, how did you identify the peers with appropriate skills and or social capital? Yeah, great question. Um, so it frequently depends, and I was referring to a study that was implemented in India and Pakistan. Um, so, and we've conducted others in Uganda as well. So um, in India and Pakistan, the peers were identified actually by the community itself, uh, the communities themselves. And it was so important to get the community buy-in to determine who those women would be. Um, and there are certain characteristics that we were looking for. So for example, in Goa, um, we looked for one of the things that did not matter was the age of the woman, simply that she had been, that she was a mom or has been a mom. Um, and that was, that was extremely important for the participant groups and the stakeholders that we, that we were involved with. Whereas in Pakistan, it was important that those women were older um, because it was um, more rural of a setting. And so it really depended on the context, but the way that we recruited them was through advertisement. Um, it, it was basically done through, through the community, through advertisement, through word of mouth. Um, and this is typically the way that we recruit in these, in these types of settings. I hope I've answered your question. I think that was a, a very uh, well-rounded response to that question. I think you could give a whole talk <laughs> In just your response, am I right? Absolutely. Um, if you're able to review the chat, we have um, many different comments and just reactions, especially the Claire's presentation, um, heartfelt comments. People were really moved by what you shared and said it was a similar experience. There were some questions related to the inclusion of the stakeholders involved in the study. So one comment says, you've indicated that the diversity that the diversity for patients, will providers be as diverse as well? Great and question. The second part to it is, how will you incorporate specific stressors that women from different racial and ethnic groups experience? Yeah, it's certainly come to life uh, over the last six months. Um, and we've actually had an explicit focus on issues of race and diversity and ethnicity that we simply, um, I cannot imagine if we were not exploring this. So let me, let me take the second one first. Um, so we actually, in, in Toronto, I'll speak about our Toronto uh, non-specialist providers. Uh, we actually have a, a pretty diverse group of individuals who come from eth ethnicity, from various ethnic backgrounds. Um, so of our eight non-specialists, um, I would say four would identify as as non-white, if I can use that term, um, and for our, our white. Um, and I think in the US, the, the stats are a little bit higher in terms of, it, it's not as equal. Um, and so this most, in um, future, as when we recruit, we really recruit people for their interpersonal skills and their passion toward maternal mental health. Obviously they can have no background, um, no formal training in mental health care. 
Um, so that's basically the foundation. But I think that it's really, really important that we that we highlight these issues. It's certainly something that's discussed during supervision. Um, and we've had a lot of diversity talks as well that are available for both our specialist providers as well as our non-specialist providers. Um, and, you know, we have one of one of the world's leading experts as the moderator on that topic. So we're really lucky um, that we can that we can discuss these things during supervision um, and that it is certainly that something that is addressed full on as opposed to something that's shoved under the rug. Wonderful. We had um, a shorter question related to the role of social workers. So when you mentioned the need for policymakers in your design and all steps of the project, right? From conceptualization to dissemination, how you think of the problem and share the problem. Um, we had several policymakers say, we're here. But then um, someone else said, what about the social workers? So well, what are the different provider backgrounds? Um, yeah. So first of all, it was a huge omission on my part not to say anything about social workers. Social workers play a critical role in this study. Um, again, and speaking from both the, the US context and the Canadian context, so frequently the social worker acts as the champion for um, promoting the study in uh, OB clinics, uh, for sending us potential participants who may be eligible and interested in the study. Um, so my apologies, I forgot to mention social work um, and we do have a few social workers on our team. Um, they are also more formally part of the team beyond stakeholders as providers. Um, so not necessarily in Canada, uh, where our specialist providers include, um, where our specialist providers include psychiatrists and psychologists, but certainly in the US, we do have a few social workers who are part of um, the specialist provider group um, that make up that, make up that, that, that delivery agent. The exciting thing about this webinar today is the interest and enthusiasm about um, getting involved for participants. Um, we have one group called Melanated Moms who says, you know, we're doing similar work for life with a baby. How do we get started? Um, Claire, perhaps you could speak to that uh, strategies for getting involved and getting started. Maybe you're running a community based organization or not for profit. How do you how do you make that bridge? And then Courtney Clyde as well, if you could um, speak to steps for getting involved um, that aren't maybe uh, researcher down, but more organic um, community forward. As I mentioned, we were P2P recipients. So we started with a small group and our group continued to grow. So two questions for both of you that are related to how does one get involved? Um, okay, so I'll start with um... Uh, the life with the baby. So, uh, like I said, initially it was um, starting a group and posting it online. I actually used, used a meetup group at first before I um, started our website. Um, I try not to, for groups, I prefer not to use Facebook. Uh, if you're starting a, a support group, I would, um, and you don't have your own website, I would go towards a meetup group just because of the um, some of the additional stressors and anxiety that parents may feel through through Facebook groups. And, um, you know, like I would just go for it. Um, whatever, like write down, I guess, some community agencies in your area that you may want to part, um, collaborate with. See if maybe they're um, running some, pro some programs um, that you can work together on. Um, in the beginning, one of the things that worked really well for us was uh, working with public he health units who they had the program, they had the funding, but they couldn't get the moms to them. But because we were a community agency without the social service stigma attached to it, we would get the group together and then we would get the professionals to come out and present to our group. So there's lots of different ways to do it and I'm always happy to help another um, community agency grow so feel free to reach out to me I'll put my email in the chat and if you're interested um, we also run um, we work with 
um, some community agencies in the states. So we run peer groups, like a focused on Canada primarily. But you can also, if you run programs and you want to reach more moms and you want to get the message to them of your program, we're always happy to post your program on our website um, and then send it out to, so more moms can get connected to you as well. So I'll thanks for saying that. We've got Jay Wilson from Melanated Mom says, we've got 6,000 moms and we're ready. <laughs> They'd like to connect directly with you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And then Courtney, before you complete your response, we also had a follow-up question in the chat box. It relates to it. Were you able to see the question? I did the see it. I, okay. And I think I can address it as well. All right. Thanks. So um, I was writing down my response to make sure that I covered all the points. Um, so how does one get involved? Um, well, for one thing, um, and in my slides, I did provide a link to our ambassadors program. And that program is basically like an extension of PCORI to a certain degree. There, um, it's a group of people who are, they in a sense drank the Kool-Aid when it comes to patient-centered outcomes research, they believe in it and they believe in ensuring that that patient voice and that stakeholder voice is a part of research funding. Um, so with that being said, joining the ambassador program, um, serving as an ambassador could be one way of getting involved. Um, and additionally, uh, we do have the merit review panel and Karen, perhaps, I don't know if you have time, but you could speak a little bit to that because you've served as a merit review panelist um, and, and Claire, I think you mentioned in your uh, presentation that um, you know, PCORI does believe that patients are experts on their lived experiences. And so uh, with our merit review panel, we do include scientists as well as uh, patients who can make the decision of whether or not a project idea or a project proposal then gets funded. Um, additionally, we have our advisory panels, and so our advisory panels help to direct and guide and provide some, um, you know, some, some guidance for our, um, our program funded areas. And all, um, all of those things, um, so the, the merit review, the ambassador program, as well as the panel um, information can be found in my slides. There's a link to reading more about that. Um, and then also, um, Karen, you mentioned the pipeline and proposal program and how the initial, that was the initial funding that this, uh, this group received. And with that program, um, there was an opportunity for patients, like one single patient to then get funding if they had a meritorious uh, project idea. Um, and then that one single patient would then receive a, a fiscal agent who would help to direct them in the steps to um, then developing research partnerships. So while the P2P program is no longer um, around at PCORI, there is Eugene Washington PCORI Engagement Awards. And so if, if there are like a group or groups of folks who, um, who have themselves established uh, with a tax ID, um, they would be available to apply to PCORI for funding for the Eugene Washington PCORI Engage Engagement Awards. And under that, um, that funding mechanism, we have the opportunities for folks to um, submit applications for capacity building, uh, for stakeholder convenings, like this one, um, for, um, and then also to, to disseminate um, information to communities that they're attached to. Um, so there are additional ways um, to get involved with PCORI. Um, if there are any groups here that are looking for tools for engaging communities, uh, we do have our tools and resources repository that can be found on our website. Also, there's a link in my slides. Um, so I, I encapsulated all of these links in the slides just to be uh, conscious of time and um, to make sure that, you know, hopefully you'll, you'll have some homework on your own so that, you know, after you leave today, you can go in and uh, click onto the PCORI website for, um, for additional information if you are interested. Um, the other question was in relation to um, ethnic uh, minorities um, or I should say, um, I, I think there was a, a, a religious or ethnic minority populations and them being the focus of a study. Um, so yes, one of PCORI's um, national priorities includes addressing or eliminating uh, disparities in health and healthcare across the U.S. Um, and um, we do have that um, as a, a funding stream. 
if um, you know if the the person who asked that question is interested in uh, learning more, there is information on our website, um, pcori.org slash topics slash addressing hyphen hyphen disparities uh, to learn more about that funding um, under the uh, the science research awards. Um, but overall, you know, the idea is uh, to address any um, any issues. Um, to, to ensure that the, uh, the disparity that, that is seen within that population is then um, brought to light. And um, as long as you can you know, make sure that you have the historical information about, um, about that, uh, the dis disproportionate healthcare burden, then um, you can certainly consider applying to that area. But if you're not yet ready for research, consider the Eugene Washington Pecori Engagement Awards which would allow you either as a researcher or as a uh, support group or patient group, one that uh, is associated with a tax ID number to then apply for PCORI funding. We have one more question for you, um, Courtney, and it's related to upcoming PCORI funding for maternal health projects. Sure. Does, are there any current or upcoming? Okay. Um, so I think we just actually had a cycle close on October 1st. Um, so I would say uh, in the new year, there should be additional opportunities uh, specifically for maternal health, uh, maternal mortality. Um, as I mentioned, that is one of our new uh, national priorities. So there definitely will be um, some great opportunities, whether or not that will call, be called out directly in, um, in funding um, announcements, I'm not 100% sure, but there will at least be a special emphasis on projects that come to PCORI um, related to maternal mortality as well as intellectual and development of disabilities. Excellent. Well, the questions have quieted and we still have nearly 100 people in attendance. I would like to transition slightly for the remaining 15 minutes. We have several of our esteemed patient and provider colleagues on the call, and we'd like to have an informal discussion with you all in reaction to this presentation. Maybe anything that you might be wondering, um, maybe you wanted to hear about the patient experience, similar to Claire's, um, similar to researchers that say this work doesn't make sense in a vacuum. We need a broader perspective to find solutions that work. Um, any of these situations that come up, I would invite you to stay on for the next 15 minutes and I'm going to ask all of our panelists, our patient partners and providers to please turn on your cameras to join this call. Thank you again so much to Daisy and Claire and Courtney. This was wildly successful. We learned so much about the, the both the importance and the process of the summit trial and the work of PCORI moving forward. So please stay if you can. Um, this is an informal discussion, and we will be sharing the links to the slides and recordings in the coming week. Thank you for attending, and stay if you can. So. So my question for you all is if you could state your name and your role and share why you became involved in patient-centered outcomes research. So many of us are involved through two different advisory boards in Illinois and Iowa. We have members from Illinois and Iowa on the call today. And for the past two years, we've built a patient-centered advisory boards that conduct health fairs, have coffee hours, and we've even designed research studies together and con conducted pilot studies where we try and find the best ways to identify women in need of care, experiencing depression, anxiety, and stress during pregnancy and the postpartum. Working alongside patients, we have more robust research than when we, when we had when it was just me, myself. So Kelly Rickman, is the co-lead of this project, David Huang, a bunch of researchers sitting around just doesn't get the job done. <laughs> so many of you have joined. If you could please share your name, your role, and why you became involved in this work. Uh, 
I'll go. Um, my name is Megan Kirkpatrick and I'm a patient. Um, very similar to Claire, I had my first child and struggled with some postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression. Um, in not as much of a similar way, I had experienced some of those things before and so I kind of knew um, that I needed to quickly get myself some mental health help. Um, but I can't, Claire, what, what you what you put out was that is so true is about the need for a support network and the need to have um, a community of moms to support you through that time with a new baby. Um, and luckily I got connected with a group here um, in Champaign. I was brand new to the town. I just moved here and didn't know anybody. And I had a baby and it was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Um, and then I did meet Karen through different baby mom groups. Um, and when she said the opportunity that there was an opportunity to share my thoughts as a patient and engage in research, that seemed like a really interesting avenue to continue, like you said, helping um, and try to help other moms. So that was what brought me to, to um, I guess we're now Perinatal Connect. Thank you, Megan. Anyone else care to share? I will. Okay. Um, I'm Sheila Rea. I'm a registered nurse and I function as a family case manager at uh, Public Health here in Champaign. Um, I have two children and I can't say that I would definitely suffer from depression. I just remember feeling really isolated both times. And there's 13 years between the ages of my children and I experience the same thing. But I worked as a psychiatric nurse years ago with uh, children from three to 10. Um, a lot of the children were DCFS wards, um, and many children of color, uh, most of them from low income families, these were behavior disordered children. And I saw the things that the families were up against that for most of the children that didn't have an underlying health condition that led them to be there, um, it was the, the pressure that the family was under, the, the inability of the parents to um, parent. Um, I came to public health and I work with low income moms, um, you know, a, a diverse population, um, women of color, uh, women of different ethnic backgrounds, but the one thing they have in common is they're all low income. And I'm seeing the same kinds of pressures. Um, there are low income women and um, what can I say, disadvantaged groups have to deal with things beyond even what I experienced, you know, um, and it's very difficult for them. We started depression screening a number of years ago and we were seeing high, high scores and no place to send them. Um, most of our moms are on Medicaid. Um, there are very few providers in this area as far that provide psychotherapy or anything beyond medication for, for the moms. So I'm really excited to see, you know, to be a part of a project that's building awareness and maybe changing the way that we look at, uh, you know, maternal health, mood disorders, and um, and how it affects everybody, you know, of all social classes. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you, Sheila. Anyone care to go next? Emily or Ruby, share your motivation. If not, I can read from the chat box. I can go. Oh, I'm sorry, Ruby. Oh, no, go ahead, Emily. Okay, thanks, Ruby. Um, I joined the group because I myself experienced postpartum depression and anxiety. And one of the things I really love about our group is that just by working weekly together and making progress and breaking silence, it, I feel like it's kind of helping me heal through this like long-term trauma that I've experienced. And just knowing that I'm not going through it alone, like, um, I don't know if it's okay. Megan and I go to church together, but we probably would have never told about our postpartum stories, you know, and it's just kind of nice to break that barrier and have really dear, make really dear friends through this. Um, I had a great pregnancy too, and my husband and I have had fertility problems and 
we waited so long to have our son and it was a lot of work. And so by the time he arrived, I couldn't imagine that I wouldn't be anything more than excited to meet him because we had worked so hard and waited so long. Um, but I had a really traumatic birth and I also went through the child welfare system and, and had some abuse when I was a child. And um, it was, I was really shocked at how the labor and delivery, um, like the body just remembers that trauma and it just, um, I don't know, like using my body for someone else. And it was kind of all the reproductive parts and it just was really traumatizing for me, brought up a lot of stuff. And my mom is also super judgy. I could hardly stand her <laughs> post maternity. She was like telling me I needed to work on my mo motherly instincts and stuff like that. So I was pretty secretive about my postpartum depression. So, uh, it just feels great to be part of this group and to have made such good friends from the group and to know that we're doing good work and expanding. And that's my motivation for joining and for hopefully staying for a long time. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Emily. All of the stories today have been moving. I would like to read one from the chat. Um, we have Jay Wilson. She says, prior to starting my organization, I worked full time for 10 years as a community health nurse um, at a community health center that served PCMH uh, for equitable health care, but no focus on maternal health. Personally, I am a four time survivor of preeclampsia. So I wanted to find a way to bridge my work as a nurse and find my need as a mother to start an advocacy network that was diverse, inclusive, and equitable. When I couldn't find one, I started my own. We've grown immensely in the past three years. So thank you so much for sharing that, Jay. Um, I should ask you actually to turn on your microphone if you're still with us and anything to add um, because we're so happy that you're here. Um, so Jay, your microphone is on now. We're so happy you're here. Um, do you have Hello? any Hi. Oh, hi. That's kind of weird. Sorry. <laughs> Can't say anything. Hi, everybody. Any interest? We're just so happy that you're here on this topic. And yes. with you and your organization, do you have interest in research projects or doing investigations to study the topic more? Yes. Um, so I do a lot of work um, with several organizations. Um, I work with the Preeclampsia Foundation. Um, I also work um, here in the state of New Jersey with um, the governor and the first lady on the research for um, creating more equitable spaces for black and brown moms um, to have positive birthing outcomes. Um, who else do I work for? I work, I do a lot of work in um, um, racial diversity. I just recently joined the um, racial equity task force with the International Association of Women. Um, and it's another one. I don't know. I just do a lot of work around DEI and maternal health and reproductive justice. Um, prior to COVID, I was really excited to be able to go to Washington when the um, the momnibus um, for the momnibus reception when they were signing the um, the different bills um, for um, Black maternal health. So I have a huge interest in that. Um, I actually received a um, a resolution from the state of New Jersey for my work here. Um, to create equitable spaces for moms and women. Um, I do a lot of focus groups as well as um, uh, group facilitation just in general um, for different moms of color across the melanated spectrum. So not just black moms, but moms from any type of diverse backgrounds. Um, and you know, it all really started from just learning how to share my personal story and how to grow from it and um, and not feeling like I was isolated in the incidents that I went through. Um, so I looked at it more as a motivation as opposed to, um, you know, just a negative experience. And I've been really, um, really fortunate enough to meet wonderful people like you guys. I don't even know who sent me this webinar, but I'm like, I'm going. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm really uh, uh, very grateful to be able to connect with women who are doing this work. Oh, I'm, I also work with the Women's Network Women's Network of something. I just did a training with them through um, 
New Jersey, uh, New Jersey Coalition to End Domestic Violence, um, the Women of Color Task Force. So we, we did a lot of work, um, again, on just creating more equitable spaces for moms um, and talking about how to um, break barriers and bridge the gaps in their personal care for themselves, as well as how to um, become better versions of themselves for their for their children and as moms, you know, to feel more proud in their motherhood. So I, I just, I love to have any type of opportunity to talk and work with other moms, women, and organizations that are doing the same work. So I'm just incredibly passionate about it. Jay, what a wonderful way to end our session. <laughs> All, everything you're doing makes me and the others, uh, we're in the same room, it makes us tired. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, um, the work that you're doing is very inspiring. And just thank you so much for joining and reaching out. This is a start of making sure that we keep the conversation going, even though we're trapped at home virtual during COVID. Yeah, um, sucks. We want to keep keep this momentum going and keep convening, keep talking, keep making shift happen, as our partners say. Um, please help us spread the word. Next week, 4 p.m. Eastern, Thursday, uh, we'll be having part two of this series. We'll be talking about maternal mortality and morbidity, maternal sickness and death, which shouldn't be happening at the numbers that it is in the U.S., if at all. Um, so yeah. please fill out the evaluation forms. Please return. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work with all of you and thank you so much for attending.